next speaker will be speaking about democracy in Africa. And I'm very passionate about this because this is really, really at the heart of all of this. It is at the heart of all of this. And like you mentioned, we can talk trade, we can talk investment, we can talk everything. If we ignore the politics of it, the leadership of it, then there will be a problem. And so uh, we're very fortunate the, this afternoon to have with us uh, a senator in Nigeria. And um, he is a member of the Nigerian Senate. Senator Ibrahim Hadija is here with us. And he will be speaking to us about reviewing democracy in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together. Let's welcome him to speak to us. And then after that, we'll have that panel discussion on the same subject, reviewing democracy in Africa. And uh, my colleague, Benjamin Akato, will be leading on that. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, your excellencies, uh, uh, CEOs, uh, business leaders, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. Uh, I was drafted to, uh, I was coming here to be part of a panel discussion and was only drafted to give uh, the keynote address, I think, yesterday. Uh, so I'm very glad, and it, it was a strange topic to me at first, uh, because uh, we're coming to an economic summit, and we're talking about democracy. But I think in the first panel, uh, one of the speakers uh, made the very, very uh, clear connection between politics and business or the economy. And uh, certainly, uh, especially in Africa, uh, the economy or a robust economy and uh, uh, a political unrest, uh, I think, uh, make very, very strange bed follows. So I'd like to start really by, uh, uh, you know, talking about uh, what democracy means uh, to different people. Because uh, the definition of democracy, as we understand it, the generic definition, elections, rule of law, uh, term limits, and so on and so forth, some argue that this is really a definition as uh, set out by the West. And maybe we need to uh, look at ourselves and define our own democracy. And it's very, very tempting also uh, to say that democracy as practiced in the West uh, maybe is not working very well in Africa. And the topic is essentially for us to find alternatives. I'm not going to talk about alternatives. I think I'll leave that uh, uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, you know, before delving into the various pros and cons, we need to understand that Africa essentially only began to experience self-rule in the 60s. I think with uh, countries like Ghana, which was one of the first countries to gain independence, uh, setting the pace, and the transition to multi-party elections taking hold from the 90s onward with the occasional military interruption. Uh, a lot of political scientists talk about some preconditions that should be in place uh, before democracy can take root. Uh, two of these, two of the major ones are a cohesive national identity uh, and a reasonably strong economy supported by a robust middle class. Uh, and if we look at uh, Africa in the 60s, I don't think uh, any of this would be, you know, uh, seem to apply to most of the countries that uh, actually transitioned democracy then. So Africa actually uh, bucked the trend, uh, uh, so to speak. Lee Kuan Yew says democracy is not appropriate in a country whose economy is weak and which does not have a middle class that constitutes between 60 to 70 percent of the population. And uh, he was talking about Burma, not even an African country. Uh, however, almost all the African democracies except maybe South Africa uh, entered multi-party politics with a low GDP per capita, very high unemployment rate, and a colonial hangover based on resource exploitation rather than nation building. Uh, a lot of these countries also had some period of military rule, and the constitutions and political systems were essentially bequeathed by the military, often without looking inwards or considering economic, cultural, and demographic uh, considerations. So if multi-party democracy as defined and practiced in the West 
where the 10 oldest uninterrupted democracies are an average of 150 years old and are still far from perfect, maybe it will be correct to say it's still in the formative stage on the African continent. My take is our perception of our democratic status as a continent has been shaped largely by a steady dose of Afro-pessimism by the press, you know, both local and international. Africa gets bad press uh, in a lot of uh, uh, respects, you know, just like we had uh, most of the economic potentials are underreported, and it seems that uh, the only thing worth reporting about Africa is crisis, war, and uh, the violence that almost precedes elections. Uh, but I think uh, we deserve uh, more of a positive outlook if we look at the fact that, like I said, we are practicing something that essentially uh, uh, bequeathed to us without most of the conditions uh, uh, in place. It's true that in Africa, electoral stakes are extremely high, and the average African politician will hardly concede an electoral defeat. Uh, you know, so the furor that follows African elections, sometimes generating into violence and unrest, also helps fuel uh, this negative vibe. But let's not forget, again, that we're essentially working with an alien doctrine uh, that we embrace without adaptation. Just like we have challenges uh, with democratic passing in Africa, we also have these challenges in Europe, Asia, Latin America. In fact, uh, there are African countries that are not a good example of an ideal democracy. We also have our shining stars and we can learn from what they're getting right instead of overgeneralizing the continent. Uh, unlike my elder brother, the uh, Minister of Environment, I'm not going to uh, mention any names because uh, he's an elder. And as I look around this room, I can see some people that can still knock my head. So let's just take it from uh, <laughs> the continental perspective. But I think we're also making steady progress. Uh, in the late 60s, 80% of African heads of state left power unconstitutionally through coups, wars, or revolutions. Today, 80% are in power through a constitutional process due to elections, expiry of term limits, death in office, or resignation. Again, uh, there's uh, a study by the uh, uh, Elections Integrity Project which essentially gave a ranking of one to 10 uh, in terms of quality of democracy uh, in the regions. Naturally, Europe and America are top. I think they got a score of about 8.9. Uh, Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa got 4.9, uh, but Asia got 4.8. And uh, uh, Sub-Soviet Europe got even lower. So even from a global perspective, African democracy cannot be said to be the worst. Uh, yes, there are countries that will drag us down, but we also have, like I said, our success stories. And uh, if we look at the fact that, uh, uh, you know, we're talking about a question of the connection between democracy uh, and the economy, uh, then certainly we cannot be said to be at the lowest end uh, uh, of the ladder. I must also make the point that uh, in seeking for alternatives to the African democratic situation, we need to understand that uh, this democracy is not a perfect art form anywhere. Uh, you know, and if we look at uh, the, the drama that has characterized the global political arena in the last 20 years or so, with the emergence of far-right groups, manipulation of the electoral process, and even a degeneration to violence, as we saw in the United States, uh, you know, the, the, the American elections uh, coming up, I think, in November will be very, very interesting. Uh, uh, looking at what has happened uh, uh, in the previous uh, election. About uh, 74 million Republicans who voted, you know, if you poll them today, a good percentage of them will still tell you that uh, the election was stolen and uh, Trump is the rightful president. And, uh, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, democracy and the administration looking at it from our own uh, uh, perspective. Someone like Trump, you know, probably the most fact-checked president in the world, uh, uh, you know, 90% of most of what he says uh, are essentially not true. But he still has that following with the American public. He still has these crazy ideas. And uh, somehow, uh, you know, uh, if you had an election today, it will not be much of a surprise uh, if Trump makes it back. Uh, is that uh, an ideal portrait of uh, a democracy? You know, you know, should we say to ourselves that uh, maybe we should 
have a democracy where you have items in place that can uh, maybe checkmate uh, some of these extreme uh, 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 leaders that you are seeing emerge uh, in the Western world. You know, these are there are challenges that are common to all democracies. You know, uh, manipulation, like I said, in looking at uh, uh, the African context, we are living in a world now where uh, social media is playing, or manipulation of social media is playing a significant role uh, in election outcomes. Uh, we've seen Cambridge Analytica, which is probably the most uh, uh, the most famous, where close to uh, you know. Almost 78 million people had their data stolen and manipulated. And manipulated in the way that where their, their mindset was being changed, essentially without them knowing. Uh, a lesser known, uh, uh, you know, uh, one came up uh, not too long ago called uh, Project Jorge, run by an Israeli. And this is a company, this goes well beyond what Cambridge Analytica did, because essentially a company that uh, said they. Uh, intervened in 33 countries, and uh, out of those 33, they got a positive outcome in 27. And a lot of these countries are in Africa. Again, I'm not going to mention any names. But let's uh, know that it went beyond what happened in Cambridge Analytica. Uh, they not only uh, accessed people's data, they hacked into emails, and then, uh, uh, you know, they had bots, essentially uh, robots that, uh, email robots that were essentially going out there uh, creating fake stories, uh, you know, demeaning opponents, and so on and so forth. And like I said, uh, uh, they claim to have uh, gotten a success rate of almost 80-90%. Uh, uh, this is all over, but I'm quite particularly worried about uh, how this will affect us in Africa because our gullibility factor is very high. You know, anybody here that uh, is on a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a WhatsApp group, family WhatsApp group, school group, will know the kind of uh, crazy stories that people forward and uh, they lap it up, you know? Uh, you know. So if you have a situation where any crazy thing would be uh, treated as uh, gospel truth, uh, then God help us if you have a situation where we move to a stage where artificial intelligence as it is now, we get to a point where elections can be won or lost, you know, based on how much you invest uh, in social media manipulation. Uh, like I said, I will not. Uh, I would not like to go into the details of if we have alternatives to democracy, uh, but uh, uh, certainly I think we should look at the fact that, assuming we find an alternative in this uh, uh, gathering, how do we implement it? You know, uh, the only way. I, you know, most of the constitutions and political systems bequeathed on us were bequeathed by the military. So unless you have a truncation in, in the administration, you know, it's almost impossible for you to have a change of political system in Africa. Yes, some of the countries have constitutional amendment clauses, but these are very, very difficult. And uh, you know, I don't see, for example, we complain about, I'm a senator, it says, uh, it's the argument that democracy is too expensive, Nigerian senators are the highest paid senators in the world, which is not true, but I don't see uh, a parliament sitting down to legislate themselves out of existence simply because there's a call uh, for a smaller uh, a parliament. We tried uh, to introduce uh, independent candidature, maybe to break the stranglehold uh, that some of the governors have uh, on primary elections. And it was thrown out. You know, yes, there are systems that are in place that can, you know, impact on small amendments to the constitution, but I think a general change uh, in the political structure is almost impossible if you don't have some kind of uh, truncation. This, I believe, is maybe uh, some of the issues that uh, uh, the panel can discuss. And like I said, I hope at the end of it uh, we may have these alternatives. Uh, well, not only can we, should we have the alternative, we should also look at how we can implement them within the existing context. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you very much, Senator. And you have really just set the stage for us for that uh, conversation. And my colleague, Benjamin Akato, will be moderating that. Uh, Benjamin, if you could just come down. Uh, but I, as you mentioned, Senator, if Africa is doing slightly better than Asia when it comes to democracy, why is the gap so yawning when it comes to the economy? Which is why we must have this conversation. Maybe our, our understanding of 
multi-party democracy the way we are doing it is just not helping us. And so I look forward to this brutally frank conversation, which will be moderated by my very eloquent colleague, um, Benjamin Akato. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll put their hands together for you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I hear we are hard pressed for time, so we'll have to make tracks. I would like to quickly invite uh, the panel members to assume their seats. We just heard from Senator Ibrahim Hadejia. Uh, please, respectfully. Member of the Nigerian Senate. Let's put our hands together for them as they come forward. We also have uh, B. Elias Shonin. If you're here, please. Former Deputy Foreign Minister, Republic of Liberia. Yes, he spoke earlier. Professor Ludeki Chweya, CEO, Kenyan School of Government. Let's put our hands together for him. Robert Wanguria, CEO of the RB company, Kenya. There's, do we have him? Okay, I heard that there was a possibility of not, his not being here. So, gentlemen, we have just about 20 minutes to play with on democracy. Senator has already established that while this is an economics summit, democracy plays a huge role in that. You can look at the IMF programs that many countries across the world are lobbying for and the role of democracy in that process. Freedom House, an NGO, wrote in 2018 that the state of democracy in the contemporary international system, including the African system, was in a state of dramatic decline. And stated that dramatic declines in freedom had been observed in every region of the world. It's already been made mention of. Only 11 African states were listed as free under the Freedom Index at the time. Botswana, Mauritius, Cape Verde, Senegal, Tunisia, Ghana, Nigeria, Sao Tome and Principe, Namibia, South Africa, and Benin. Since that time, we've had a number of coup d'etats, military putches, we've had attempted coups, we have had democratic governments push their tenures through processes that in some instances you would call illegal. We've seen what has happened in the Ivory Coast, Alassane Ouattara, among others. So the initial question I'll be posing to you gentlemen, when you look at the the state of democracy on the continent currently. What do you see? And with these categorizations of flawed democracies, hybrid democracies, authoritarian regimes, what do you think is not working for Africa? And what do you think is working for Africa when it comes to democracy and governance? I'll start with you, Senator. I'll start with you, Senator. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, once again, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that uh, uh, according to report, democracy is on a decline uh, on a global uh, basis. Uh, because uh, a few years ago, uh, when you talk about decline and reduction in quality of election, the whole focus is on Africa. Uh, uh, so we recognize the fact that uh, uh, you know, it's a global problem. What we can do, my own, my own take is the fact that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we are working with something that was uh, given to us, a one-size-fits-all uh, solution that's given to us. And studies have also shown that uh, despite the limitations, you know, despite uh, uh, the fact that uh, we're almost not ready for democracy based on the preconditions set out by the West, we have not been doing too badly. Uh, some people say we're actually doing much better in multi-party democracy than in some states in the West. If you look at most of the major Western democracies, they're not essentially multi-party democracies, essentially two-party democracies. There are two main parties, whether they're talking about the United States, whether they're talking of uh, the United Kingdom. Most of them have two main parties and very, very small fringe parties that are now just uh, making them. But in most African countries, uh, uh, the multi-party uh, 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 structure, you know, is more glaring. Uh, you, you know, yeah, there may be one or two dominant parties, but 
Uh, they are also significant players, and as you have seen recently, even in recent case in Nigeria, it is actually possible uh, for a third force to come in and make uh, 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 you know significant uh, uh, impact. Uh, again, uh, you know, looking at uh, 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 we, we mentioned some countries. We have some countries that, even within the Western context, uh, are essentially best cases in terms of uh, democratic outlook. Uh, my problem, you know, uh, in, in, in advocating for a hybrid or change or coming up with an African model is that how do you apply it within the African context? If you find a model that's very suitable for Mauritius, uh, with a population of 2 million, or Seychelles, a small island nation with a population of 5,000, if it works there, will you now take it and apply it to Ghana? or apply to Nigeria, 200 million, 317 ethnic nationalities. How do we, you know, well, let's not move away from a one-size-fit-all uh, model that's been bequeathed to us by the West, to a one-size-fit African model uh, that we think can work from uh, Cameroon all the way to uh, South Africa. Yes, uh, uh, you know, there are certain peculiarities. Uh, maybe we should agree on what should be a commonality you know, free and fair elections, uh, rule of law, uh, term limits, and so on and so forth. And then leave the nitty gritty, uh, maybe to the individual countries to find systems uh, that can suit them, you know, from a cultural perspective, mm. from an economic perspective, you know. I just mentioned the fact that democracy is expensive. Some people will argue that it's a small price to pay. Uh, if we look at the gap between the economies, is it fair to take a very expensive democratic structure and impose it on a small island state, you know, that, uh, you know, is barely keeping its head above water. Uh, these are, I think, uh, uh, some of the issues, like I said, that uh, we should be uh, talking about. Thank you so much, Senator. Let's put our hands together for him. Let me quickly move on to B. Uh, Elias Shoni, and former Deputy Foreign Minister, Republic of Liberia. It, it took me down memory lane, 1989. I was... I will not mention my age. I was just a boy in Monrovia fleeing that first civil war because it had broken out and we were caught right in the thick of it. House hit by mortar shells. It was a terrifying experience. You look at a country like Liberia with developments since that time through uh, Madam Sirleaf to George Opong where currently. What do you think are the highlights of democracy on the continent. The, the reports we keep getting will highlight Mauritius, Botswana, Ghana, among others. But within these countries themselves, there are serious problems. Some have looked at Rwanda and all that is happening there. But some have also painted that country black, calling it authoritarian. What do you think? You read from the likes of Lee Kuan Yew, from third world to first world and you realize that something must be done. What do you feel must be done? What must be done to fill that gap? Okay, thank you very much. Um, when we talk about democracy, I think we need to first dissect and differentiate democracy and development. We need to figure out if there are strong correlation between the two or not, because the context that you just asked that question uh, gives me the sense that uh, once there's democracy, there's supposed to be development, particularly within the context of uh, Lee Kuan Yew, uh, Singapore, and Kagami, Rwanda. But I believe that the model of democracy practiced by Lee Kuan Yew at the time and now Kagami are not the very popular model that have been lauded and healed by the international community. But I believe that those are models that fit their society. Because when you look at the level of prosperity, those two societies uh, in the context of uh, Singapore saw, so, and now we've seen in uh, Rwanda, which many other countries in Africa have been encouraged to learn from their experience, I, I, I think it's working for them. It's working for them. But how be it? I believe very strongly in liberal democracy and in irrespective of how one would like to interpret it. Um, when it comes to my country, Liberia, 
I believe the, the penetration, the democratic penetration or democratization ha has not been even in terms of games. At some point, we scored real high games. And at other points, we declined. We saw a significant decline. And now, let's compare the last, uh, let's look at the last 16 years in our post-conflict era. We got the first female elected president in Liberia, elected democratically, free, fair, transparent. And what we saw at the time, what her notion of democracy was beyond election, we saw the level of freedom, the level of free speech, and the level of open government. In her government, she had uh, oppositions. In fact, the opposition leader, the main opposition party leader was in her government as an ambassador of peace, and government was paying him $15,000 a month. Yeah, to run his office. And the chairman of that party also was also an assistant minister in her government. So when you look around her government, you see clearly that it was not like winner took all. She thought it was important to build a more inclusive government because that's how you gain and enjoy legitimacy. Right. And also, you reduce the level of pressure that will come out because when you try to think of development, and there's particularly when there's so much development needs, and you have to be thinking about suppressing uh, uh, protests and demonstration each day, it takes away. And, but those are part of the democratic process. So we saw an expansion, an increase in democracy at the time, and she transitioned to um, George Weir, and I think the transition was very democratically done, and the world healed Liberia for that. But unfortunately, we are beginning to see decline now in, uh, in our, our democratic pedigree, and that's why Liberia is not on that list. Yeah. But I also want to make clear uh, before I turn it back uh, over, electioneering is not democracy. Electioneering is a part of democracy, and I believe is the foundation of democracy, but governance is the main aspect of democracy that I think we need to focus as Africans. You see? Because to win an election in Africa is, I would say, is easier in, a, in many ways. And, and we must understand the context of our voting. What influence, what the motivation of African voting? In my country currently, there was an unofficial pool done because we head into election in October. An unofficial pool was carried out. We have three persons heading for the presidential election. We got the incumbent, uh, George Weir. We have the former vice president, Honor Salif, uh, Joseph Waika, and we got the former chief executive, the former deputy global chief executive of Coca Cola, Alexander Cummings. And that pool results indicated when the question was asked among the three that are running, who do you think will reshape Liberia and and purpose and position Liberia to sustain economic development. I'm told Edith Cummings had 60%, 61% confirmed that he could be the one. Next to him was Joseph Boyka, and then last was Joshua, the incumbent. But when the second question was asked, if the election was today, who are you going to vote for? Joshua, 27%, that's the incumbent. The former vice president to Sir Leave, 25 percent, and Alexander Cummings, 6 percent. <laughs> so what does it tell you? That the motivation of voting in Africa is not for progress, even though we want progress. There are a lot of factors and influence that make us the vote. Ethnicity, regionalism, relationship, religion, those are the reasons we vote. We don't vote because the person has what it takes to change Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you. Interesting point you made, and uh, maybe after we're done here, since the time is so short, we shall have more of a conversation on that correlation. But coming to you then, uh, Professor Chweya, as we've already had Mr. Shoning talk about governance, it quickly reminded me of Barack Obama when he first came to the continent of Africa, when he was president. He came to Ghana, and he said, you do not need strong men. You need strong institutions. I'm sure many of you recall. But what is the correlation, again, then, between strong institutions and development? In this case, economic development. Over to you, sir. Right. 
<clears throat> so thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, distinguished forum and for this opportunity to share some of the ideas I have on this subject. And uh, I would like to, first of all, say this, and which forms the background to my response to the question raised. I've spent most of my academic life studying political science and taught political science at university. Then eventually, I was appointed permanent secretary in government, then became a senior government official, and then sat in government forums, decision-making forums, and had opportunity to have to grapple with directly with the challenges and that, 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 that the population faced to the extent that uh, my portfolio was concerned. And now my responsibility is to develop programs to build the knowledge and skills and competencies that government officials require to discharge their, their duties. Now in all of this, I have learned a lot and I'm going to set aside my political science, I'm going to set aside my, my position as, <laughs> and, <laughs> as a government official and so on. I just want to share some ideas where from I'm now not sure anymore. First of all, uh, uh, human society requires two priority uh, desires, uh, has two priority desires. Number one is prosperity. Uh, social economic prosperity and desire to fulfill the needs of life and just have good life. Uh, you want to be able to have food, health care, housing, education for your children, and so on. Uh, transportation, make, you want to have comfortable living. Now, this is a primary goal. The second goal is freedom. People want to realize freedom. They want to feel they are free to realize their potential, free to express themselves, free to enter whatever enterprise they want to enter into, whatever business they want to enter into, and so on and so forth. So they want freedom. Now, there could be many others, but for my purpose this afternoon is those two. Now, freedom, the goal to realize freedom has to do with democracy as we know it now. And, and, and therefore, we could today say society desires democracy. How do you define democracy? They want to have a legitimately identified government and that, that they want to have a rule of law so that there is predictability and fairness in running government. And number three, they want to see accountability in the running of government. So we desire democracy, however defined. Nobody is imposing a version of democracy on, uh, on Africa. When we, we realized independence, there was a starting point, And there was nothing wrong in having a certain starting point. And, and what mattered is how we adjusted that that we received at the starting point over the last 60 years. So it's not fair to continue to blame the colonialists for handing down to us a model 60 years ago. The question is, what have you done to adjust that model and customize it to your needs six, six decades later? So that is, uh, now, but we have to realize this, that even in Western Europe, Democracy did not just fall down to them. They worked so hard, moving away from period of absolutist monarchical system uh, to liberal democracy. So even for them, they have worked at it. So the point is this. Democracy is work in progress. Now, in the West, it is economic prosperity that assisted in the development of liberal democracy. It is capitalism and 
the bourgeoisie classes, if you like, I say that I won't go into political science, and, and, and the, the prosperous social classes that emerged in society that exerted pressure upon the absolutist monarchical system to, to, for, for that system to give them the opportunity to have a say in how the tax revenue they contributed to was actually shared. And that marked the beginning of the growth of liberal democracy in the West. So in short, my position is this. There is a correlation between democracy and development. In the West, it is economic development, read capitalism, that compelled the adjustment of the existing authoritarian monarchical system to begin to give way to liberal democracy. Now, then hence, that's the correlation. Here in Africa, we have worked so hard to realize democracy. And we have attempted to work hard to realize economic development. But the, the pursuit of democracy is more vigorous than the pursuit of development. Therefore, is it possible to enjoy freedom, read democracy, in the context of poverty? It is extremely difficult. Citizens want freedom, but they also want prosperity. So if you introduce, and I must finish in one minute, if you introduce a highly democratic system, but do not work hard to raise prosperity, citizens will not be comfortable with you because they will ask you, shall we eat freedom? Shall we eat elections? Shall we? So, so, for, for, so if you want to protect the democratic system you have introduced, you must stimulate economic development so that citizens can realize prosperity. <laughs> now, we, so, so prosperity buttresses democracy, and democracy buttresses prosperity. Now, finally, here in, in Africa, and it was discussed in the earlier panel, the matter of democracy, intra-Africa trade, and so on. My point is this. Prosperity and development can only make sense if we industrialize our economies. Short of industrialization, it will be extremely difficult. Even if we say we promote intra-African trade, but we want machines, then we have to go out. So if we want to promote intra-African trade, we must stimulate industrialization. So if Kenya wants earth movers or tractors to stimulate agriculture, we should be able to buy these from Ghana. And if we want water pumps and solar panels, we should Im import these from Nigeria and so on. But if Nigeria, Ghana produces cocoa, Kenya produces tea, so how shall we promote intra-Africa trade or trade between Ghana and Kenya? G Ghana produces cocoa. We produce tea. They still serve the same purpose. Because in the morning, you can either have tea or cocoa. So th there is a problem. Now, with regard to global trade, if Western countries come with microchips, iPhones into the market, and we in Kenya go with leaves, tea leaves. We, we cannot make it. Organa goes with raw gold and raw cocoa. We cannot. How many tons of tea leaves do you need to equate iPhones, iPads, and microchips? So we need to industrialize. Thank you very much. Time is not our friend. I'll have just a final round. So I'll pose a number of questions. Each one of you can take just one in one minute, a maximum of one minute each for whatever you're going to respond to. In Ghana, we ask, na roads we go chop. In other words, will we eat roads based on what you said? It's also curious, Belgium or Brussels, whichever way you want to look at it, is the chocolate capital of the world. 
Do they produce cocoa? Switzerland, a great chunk of the banking system operates through Switzerland. It is, it, it refines most of the gold across the world, 40 to 70 percent, Switzerland. Do they produce gold? So we are sitting on the re, uh, resources and yet, like Prof said, all the, the mechanized action is elsewhere. Obviously, they will develop and you will underdevelop. It's not rocket science, is it? Anyway, I just wanted to pose these questions very quickly. We've spoken about the linkages, democracy, economic development. How do we, I remember one of you spoke about, I think it was um, Shonin, how do we reorient or disabuse the minds of the African electorate to vote on issues? It may seem to be a very simple issue, but it isn't. Then, how do we contextualize our democracy? If you go in India, democracy is practiced in a specific way. If you go to Australia, it is democracy still in its own context. When I had an interaction recently with the Swiss ambassador, she made mention of the fact that 200 years ago, Switzerland was poor. And that is true. We don't go into history sometimes. We do not realize that these nations once were like we are. But it's also said that you don't reinvent the wheel. So you don't have to go and start with a square wheel when everyone is using a round wheel. You just learn and move on. She spoke about their decentralization into cantons and all of that. How can we pick these but contextualize them and make the most of them? Whatever your thoughts are in a minute, a minute and a half each. I'll start with you, Senator. Thank you very much. Well, I, I, I honestly think it's a, a chicken and egg uh, situation. Uh, you know, uh, democracy as practiced, uh, you know, and on, 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 under the absolute oppressing levels of poverty. Uh, you know, there's no way, just like uh, my colleague said, elections don't necessarily translate into democracy. And elections in these indices uh, uh, really make very, very little sense. So where do we start from? Uh, uh, you know, do we have to focus on uplifting uh, the economic level, get people to a point where they're thinking about other things rather than, you know, apart from what they they'll eat tomorrow. Uh, and then, of course, you now get to a point where, yes, you can start talking about issues. In the African country, from Nigerian context, I'm sure in most African countries, nobody talks about issues when you come to elections. I mean, we, 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 we rather focus on basic things, we rather focus on uh, 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 how to induce the electorate. And it's very easy when your electorate are at a certain level of uh, poverty. So, like I said, uh, chicken and egg situation. I don't know really how to. Uh, uh, you know, whether the present system will get us to a point where we've uplifted our people uh, out of poverty. Some argue that what China achieved, you know, lifting 400 plus million people out of poverty within a short time, will not happen under the normal democratic uh, uh, context because of the various uh, uh, push and pulls within that system. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And again, just like you mentioned, you don't have to, we can leapfrog uh, with the right uh, visionary leadership, uh, I think with the right uh, collaboration from the African perspective. Yeah, we don't have to go through the long process. Uh, right. Uh, we're, we're, we're technological uh, age, you know, all you have to do is uh, uh, focus on what you want, collaborate and leapfrog uh, to a point, uh, uh, you know, where you get to where you want to be. Uh, we need to have in place uh, policies that protect our local industries. The West didn't industrialize overnight. And uh, if you look at what is happening now, most of the very, very stringent conditions, whether it's come to trade or whatever that they put in order uh, for them to develop uh, uh, domestically, they are now trying to do the reverse for Africa. You know, once you say, no, I don't want, uh, uh, nobody should come and take out uh, raw cocoa, you have to come and they start pointing out to you various clauses and whatever that you've uh, contravened, whether it's uh, on the WTO and so on and so forth. But I think we'll have a stronger voice uh, if we speak as a continent rather than as individual countries. 
Thank you very much. On to you, uh, Mr. Shani. Okay. Um, uh, in 2021, I authored, I published uh, an article titled Uncertain Future for Democracy in Africa and the Middle East. And, uh, and in that article, uh, uh, the crux of the article was that was on two fronts. The first front was that uh, there seems to be a nostalgia for democracy in Africa, particularly since many people are realizing that the Africans, Africa has been trying to uh, penetrate. Democratiz democratization has been trying to move, penetrate in many African systems, and it doesn't seem to be working. So what we just saw what, rec what recently happened in Mali and, Boswan and, uh, and uh, uh, Burkina Faso. Coup d'etat in Guinea, those were things that we all thought were behind Africa, but we see them popping up again. Those are all that bring discouragement to the effort of democratization. However, when it comes to the context of uh, democracy and development, I believe firmly that the correlation is not very strong. I don't think it's strong. I think it's important to give your people freedom because it positions them to think freely, and once people think in freely, there'll be new, ide uh, new ideas, new issues, new creativity, innovation, and whatever it is to spur development. But at the same time, the most important tool for development in any country would be to invest in your people and to build strong, reliable, independent institutions. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, a lot has been said and great ideas, but let me just uh, caution uh, uh, against uh, what's emerging as uh, you know, an option for us. When you promote FDI, foreign direct investment, a lot of people feel it's the right thing to do, so if there is high FDI inflow in your country, you feel happy. But it is also a trap because it simply means your country is a site at which the investment of other people is taking place. What about your own investment? And chances are then whoever came as a guest investor through FDI can say, thank you very much for your great hospitality, and now I'm going back home. And, and then what do you remain with? So, so let's not glorify, glorify FDI too much. Yeah? And just as I said, let us try to industrialize our countries. Today, the whole, the world generally is talking about the fifth. I think they are now in the fifth industrial revolution. Yeah. No, they are now at fifth, sir. They, they was first, second, fourth. Recently, I was studying around this matter. I, I, I saw there is a fifth. I don't know harmony between machines and human beings and things like that. Now, at what stage is Africa? Are we first, second, third, fourth, or fifth? None. I can tell you we are none. And that is our, our, our tragedy. And, and now some of our people talk about, you know, IT, digitalization. We are now fourth industry. Who is fourth? We in Africa, are we? So we need, honestly, brothers and sisters to do everything we can to industrialize our society. Now, the connection, brother here has talked about connection with the development, is an interesting subject to think about. But the truth of the matter is that when you develop your society, citizens feel the socioeconomic gain they even become disinterested in politics to the extent that they will not agitate right. and disrupt the system. Mm. Be they might not even turn up for election because they will be happy, comfortable, they will be satisfied, they will be preparing six course breakfast. They have no time to go for elections. <laughs> Similarly, they have no time to go and engage in activities that will disrupt the political system. In fact, in some countries now, elections, voting is being like encourage, please come and vote, please. But people are already comfortable with prosperity. So, so, so democ let us not worry about that. Let us promote industrialization. Let us build democracy. They will meet somewhere, and Africa will be a great place to live in. Thank you very much.
Gentlemen, uh, we're grateful. I see you have a question. You may have to save it for later because time, I just consulted uh, the Master of Ceremonies, is not our friend. Uh, we're very grateful to, his, his hand is still up. <laughs> that is one insistent uh, questioner. All right, let's, let's hear you. Do you have a microphone there? No? Let me quickly bring this to you. All right. Please make it snappy, very snappy. All right, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Amin Dasara, and I'm from uh, IFED Global. Um, the professors have raised an interesting uh, topic, and I have, I have uh, a position which I want to put it out to them and suggest to them to see how best we can, as Africans, chart our own path of uh, democracy to promote uh, economic development. So they mentioned that we should uh, chart our own path to democracy that promotes economic development. A democracy that has a positive correlation with uh, development. So the question is, don't we think that the frequent change of government in Africa within four year term, mostly, is not fit to, pro uh, to propel economic development? Because when you consider uh, countries like Singapore, Rwanda currently, uh, there, there is some kind of stable and sustainable government that charts their path of democracy to okay. improve development. So don't you think that we should also adopt that model of a long-term government that can improve development in Africa? Thank you. I think we get the thrust of, of your question. Long-term versus four-year ten years, six-year ten years. Indeed, he has a point. Uh, how long has Kagame been in office now? Rather long. Uh, and he makes mention of him. What do you make of that? Do we need that to sustain development? Uh, I don't know whether you would want to hazard anything on this. No? Okay. Then we can call the session to an end. B. Elias Shonian is a former Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, Republic of Liberia. We also had Professor Ludeki Chweya, CEO, Kenya School of Government. Uh, you got us laughing at a point. Very serious issues you were. You brought to bear, though. And Senator Ibrahim Hadejia, member of the Nigerian Senate. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining this panel. Please, let's put our hands together for them. My name is Benjamin Akakbo. Thank you for your time. I hand over now to Mr. Medu. One more time, let's do it for them and for Benjamin as well. I told you this was going to be fascinating and it has been.